this is my son, Lucas. And for me, this picture evokes a sense of feeling completely at home in the universe. And that was something that I received in full measure six years ago when I experienced the most profound spiritual awakening of my life. I had a born-again experience. Now, traditionally, that often means being born again often means believing in Jesus. For me, it happened when I lost my faith as I knew it. God had become more of a metaphor for me, and at that point, I no longer believed in an afterlife. That was a very dramatic change for me. In fact, a week later, it was such a dramatic change that I woke up in the middle of the night, 3 a.m., in a panic, and took to my journal in order to try to get a hold of myself, because I was afraid of my own thoughts and emotions. I had kind of a glimpse of what it must be like for someone who is uh, considering taking their life because of emotional terror. Or what it must be like for someone to jump from a burning building because the terror of falling and dying is outweighed by the terror of the flames. But thankfully that subsided and I was able to get to sleep after journaling a bunch. The next morning, however, I wasn't in much better state. This was in late April 2012. I remember sitting on the stairs of our house uh, inside, um, just weeping. I had to call my, uh, my boss to cancel an important business trip that I was supposed to be on. My wife called our neighbors to try to get help. And I ended up spending 10 days at my mom's house just to rest and recover. It was kind of like uh, Neo in the Matrix when he gets unplugged for the first time from the Matrix and those machines are rebuilding his muscles were just lying there. And he, um, it's kind of like he was rebuilding what was to become the second half of his life. So how did all of this happen? And what does it have to do with spiritual awakening and feeling at home in the universe? Well, I'll start at the beginning. I was raised in a Christian home. I was devoted to Jesus from an early age. I believed that Jesus was real and that he loved me. And uh, I was not a good fundamentalist, though, because sometimes people would say, oh, those people, they're in hell now because they didn't believe before they died. And I just rejected that kind of certainty and said, only God knows their fate, and didn't Jesus teach us to and not judge people anyway. Um, but one thing I did embrace was uh, a rejection, if you will, of teaching uh, science about evolution. And I thought that evolution was against what the Bible said about uh, how God created the world. And I learned to kind of make fun of millions of years and billions of years as if that was such a ridiculous thing. Um, however, when I went off to college, I, it's a Christian college, I met other Christians who believed different things about evolution, so I got a little bit confused and thought, well, maybe it's, I'm not going to fall on my sword over this issue. It's not a question of salvation. Um, and so I kind of lost interest in debating it um, for at least 15 years. After college, I got married and had three kids. And in 2010, I started experiencing some really disturbing symptoms, neurological symptoms, tingling in my feet, uh, sharp stabbing pains, muscle twitching. And in 2011, I started a new job and was hit with tremendous fatigue and all kinds of symptoms like uh, mood issues, psychological issues, rage, irritability, sometimes uh, when putting the kids to bed I had to just remove myself because everything was grating on me. Um, I had trouble thinking, brain fog, and digestive issues, etc. And so we 
were searching and searching for what is wrong with me. I want to figure this out because it felt like a detour from life. Like life is not working right. And I want it to go back to working right so I can function in my job and be a father and not miss out on my kid's childhood. Well, we saw lots of doctors. Um, I saw lots of doctors and got lots of diagnoses uh, like neuropathy and parasites and low hormones. And with each treatment, I had hoped that this might be it. Maybe I'll be able to get back on track, but I uh, was disappointed each time. So it was a really uh, roller coaster ride. And I had this sense of meaninglessness kind of creep up on me. And I, this whole time, I was trying to be faithful and was journaling and praying and saying, God, help me. And what, you know, I'm trying to do everything right here. What's, what's the deal? Um, but I also had a thread of hope that maybe, maybe there's some meaning to this sense of meaninglessness. Maybe it's not just a detour. So in my quest for health, I came across a book called Brain Rules, which I knew, I happened to know had been written by a Christian. And one of the chapters was called uh, Your, uh, The Human Brain Evolved Too. And this kind of brought me up short a little bit and set me on uh, an exploration. I started finding other resources written by people of faith about evolution. And this time I was interested and open-minded because it really mattered to me because I'm dealing with the, my physical reality and the fact that it's, it's not really working right. <laughs> and I read a paper online called Radiometric Dating from a Christian Perspective, and it single-handedly convinced me that the Earth appears to be about four and a half billion years old. I took the next step, which was to figure that it must be about four and a half billion years old, because there were more theological problems with believing that it's not than believing that it is, because I don't believe in a God who's trying to deceive me or is lying. I read another book called Finding Darwin's God, a scientist's search for common ground between God and evolution. And like I said, I was open to the new information now, and my worldview started to change. And I was embracing this mainstream theory in science. And, but I wasn't sure how it was going to play out, because it really was messing with my theology, because I was taught and believed that Adam and Eve, when they sinned, that was the introduction of death into the world. But with evolution, death preceded humanity by millions of years. So I wasn't sure how that was going to work out. Um, but while my intellectual journey continued, my emotional state kept worsening. And some of the worst times, most difficult times for me were on business trips. Uh, one time I was in Ohio teaching for a week, and in the middle of the night, in my hotel room, I suddenly got enraged at someone that I had, I had seen in Barnes & Noble earlier that day. Um, I think he may have been mentally disabled, but the way that he looked at me later on, I was thinking about it and just got so angry that I was enraged here in bed and I became afraid of, like, this is messed up, why am I being this way? And then I started crying uncontrollably and got afraid of that. And then I remembered that I had a friend back in Washington State who said that I could call him if I had ever needed to talk to someone. And uh, I called CJ in the middle of the night, and he talked to me. And that human connection helped grounded me, helped ground me and calm me down as I really get back to sleep. Another time in February of 2012, I was uh, at a conference in Prague in the Czech Republic. And on the last night of the trip, I decided to go for a walk in the town to see some of the cultural highlights and it trudged through the snow. It was very cold. So when I came across a church, a St. Kajitan's church, that had a sign that said organ concert and a heating, there's a heater inside. I thought, oh, that's, yeah, two birds with one stone. So I bought a ticket and went inside and unfortunately there was this little space heater and everyone was already crowding around it. <laughs> so I just sat in the back in the last pew, and I couldn't see the organists, they were up behind me, so just sitting here, cold, in this huge, kind of empty cathedral, in a sacred space, 
hearing sacred music, seeing all these sacred images, is very ornate. And I felt completely empty. I was despairing. And I started weeping, but it wasn't cathartic. It was more terrifying. And so back in my hotel room, I, I was journaling again, sort of demanding that God reveal himself to me. You know, are you just an invention of humans? What's, what's the deal? And I felt sorry for myself. I thought about killing myself, but not really because, I mean, there's no way I could have done it. I had just bought presents for my kids and my wife, and they were sitting there on the hotel room bed. And then at about 4 a.m., some of my coworkers came back from bar hopping, and I poked my head out in the hallway and said, Hi. <laughs> and they said, Hey, you need to come hang out with us if you're awake right now. So I went into the next room, and we ended up talking about the afterlife. Because <laughs> it was kind of an open question for me, and I managed to steer the conversation, I think. That's probably what happened. Um, heard different people's opinions, and. Uh, nothing was resolved that night, but it was a really nice human connection. I felt kind of love and camaraderie with them. It's just a little bit of light and a lot of darkness. Well, finally, in March of 2012, I was diagnosed with Lyme disease. Thanks to my wife, Lisa, and her instincts, I was tested and tested positive, and on Easter Sunday, uh, began what ended up being six months of antibiotic treatment. Two weeks into antibiotics, I hit bottom in my depression. I went up to the top of my stairs, my home office, getting ready on a Monday morning to go to work, and I couldn't do it. My mind was completely spent. I was tired of trying to figure out my health and figuring out life <laughs> and career contentment and I just gave up and this cloud of depression just descended over me and I started to moan and it was really horrible so I decided to go downstairs and try to sleep because I had learned that sleeping was a pretty foolproof way of changing my state so I went on the couch and pulled my covers over my head, and this wail just came out from deep within me. I wasn't trying to make it happen. Something was happening though, um, but I felt, I was despairing and I felt alone in the universe. I felt abandoned by God. And I slept there for four hours, woke up, and felt exactly the same way, which was very disturbing. But I managed to think about my kids a little bit. And also, a couple of weeks earlier, um, I had made a commitment to say yes to life at a Passover Seder meal that one of my neighbors was hosting. And so I mustered up the strength to get up and go to community dinner, etc. What happened the next day was remarkable. My theological framework at that point was hanging on by a thread. And I just, I just let go. It's just the easiest thing. It's just like a door opened in my mind. So I didn't know what that meant. It's like, what's next? I felt kind of like everything had come to an end. I couldn't really understand. Why am I still alive? It's weird, like, I'm here. But it was kind of like I was in a, I, I, it, was, it felt like everything felt new all of a sudden. That week was the most amazing week. People were, every person was so amazingly beautiful. Their eyes were like streaming rivers of light. And I felt so connected to everyone. I just naturally loved everyone as myself and life was just exciting and vibrant and colorful and 
I, 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 I was having a taste of heaven on earth, really. Um, so, what about, but what about the terror, the night of terror that happened a week later? Well, I think I was still holding on in my identity to, like, there was just a lot of reorganization that needed to take place. Like, I went from basically the darkest day of my life to the brightest day of my life in six days. <laughs> and that was a lot of change to reorganize around. And so, like I said, I went and stayed at my mom's for those 10 days. And terror did not persist. Newness of life won out. It prevailed. It was like resurrection superseded death. And then a funny thing started happening. All of these scriptures that I knew started coming back to me and the words came alive to me like never before. And my own religion, Christianity, started meaning way more to me than it did before. It made more sense. Uh, scriptures, words of Jesus, other scriptures, like um, he said, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it only remains a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. And so this pattern of transformation I could see, and I, I, I believe and I believe that it's not a one-time thing. It's something that can keep happening. And so today it's like, what can I die to today to make room for new life? And I, I also had no deep existential questions anymore. Like, I still have questions. I'm still very interested in truth and understanding things. And, but I don't have, like, it's, it's not... Uh, question of I just feel at home here <laughs> I just feel at home in the universe and I especially did in that week and I've had glimpses of it since then but because of that week and those experiences it's not that I always feel it now I still feel lonely and <coughs> disconnected at different times but I have a faith it's like rock solid that I know <coughs> that life is for me not against me and so that faith can, I, encourages my, I, I can encourage myself with it, and I can encourage others. Um, so I can say, if you're here and you feel, have questions about, like, if, do I belong here on Earth? Or what is the purpose? Do I have a, pur do I have a purpose? The answer is yes. We do belong here. You belong here. And... Also, there's always more. There's always more to just beyond our current frames or our current suffering, our current joy. There's always more. And I want to conclude with a little song that I wrote. Um, and it has words of Jesus in it, but rather than just hearing it in a religious sense, I hope you can hear it in a kind of more universal sense as an affirmation of the ultimate friendliness of existence and a promise and an invitation that if you yield your life to the whole, if you yield the burden of being alive in a body on the planet, kind of like Lucas in the picture, you will find support and stable ground.
It's a strange thing because you don't really <coughs> look sick to other people. And you have doctors telling you, there's nothing wrong with you, so you just need to fix your attitude or something like that. And, um, and it, it could be a real roller coaster ride so that I would sometimes have a lot of energy and then I would get hit really hard later. And so from the outside, people necessarily tell um, so you have to kind of the only way people know in some some ways if you're able to share and so yeah you're welcome thank you thanks Evan thank you, thank you. Thank you.